cryptic book. And therefore, it can seem scary, right? It can seem a little frightening when you try to interpret this, this book. But I want to remind us that it's really a letter also, um, just like the epistles uh, that we all find such comfort in. And it was written to specific believers for a specific purpose, just like all the letters. And so we also can find great comfort, just as it brought comfort 2,000 years ago uh, to the believers there in Asia, so it can bring comfort to us today. That's how God's word works. So it was written for many reasons, of course. And, and, and you know, there's many things we do see in Revelation. One of those was, of course, to comfort the believers in Asia. Another was to reveal information of things that will come in the future. We understand that. But I will say that the main purpose, the main reason for this book is to provide Christians with a view of history from God's vantage point in heaven and not ours. So I want to... I want to restate that. The biggest thing that Revelation does for us, and the biggest reason I believe God gave it to us, was so that we could see world history revealed from his vantage point and not from ours as we're going through it. Uh, Like what James Montgomery Boyce says about this. He says, the primary purpose of Revelation is to enable Christians from every age and in every possible circumstance to view what is happening in history from God's point of view rather than from man's and to be comforted and strengthened by it to live for Christ and his glory at all times. And that what, what he said there is so important at the very last that we may be comforted and strengthened to live for Christ and his glory. So I think that's really what we miss a lot of times as we approach Revelation. We, we fail to let it actually be a blessing to us now and an encouragement to actually live for Christ. And so that, that's really the, the purpose. Not, you know, just thinking about tonight, just thinking about even just these two verses, but just the whole book. If we really believe this, if we, and this is, this is, this, this is true for all of God's word, Right? If we really believe that this is the inspired word of God, what are we doing sometimes with our lives? Really, what are we doing with our lives if we really believe this? So I want us to enter tonight with that somber thought. Do I believe this is a word from God and that all of this will come to pass? If we believe it, we will not and cannot live the same as everybody else in this world that does not believe it. So God gave this message, as we've already said, to his people. I just want to review a little bit from last week. What does verse 1 tell us in this this book? Chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. So we understand this book was given to God's people to show things that will take place. Then we see it's a blessing. Verse three, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it for the time is near. So today we're gonna to look at the, the last two verses of John's greeting. That's what, this, that's what these verses are. Verses one through eight are basically the greeting of John. And then next uh, week, we'll head more into the vision of what John sees. But just by way of review to get us caught up to verse 7, which is, again, one of the last verses in that greeting, I want to begin with verse 4, which is the official greeting, when John says, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before the throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, that is the Trinity mentioned there the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings of earth to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom priest to his god and father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen so we talked about that last week as we closed out that is like a doxology it is just a time of praise it is lifting up christ which is what the book of revelation does and now we come to verse seven, which is still part of that greeting, but it's very, you would have thought it would have ended there in verse six, but we have verses seven and eight that are tacked on here as well. And this is very interesting. Notice what he he says in verse seven. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. Basically, 
after he says all that, he says, yes, so be it. Yes, you heard me correct, so be it. That's kind of what he says here. He's coming in the clouds, every eye will see him, and they will weep, and they will mourn on account of him. It's going to happen, so be it. That, that's what he says there. Now, this language, every Jewish person who heard this language would have been drawn immediately to Daniel chapter 7. We mentioned last week the connection between this prophetic writing and another prophetic writing, that of Daniel, the prophet. And, and, and in Daniel chapter 7, the prophet sees a vision. He sees four beasts rising out of the sea. And these beasts basically persecute the people of God, until a champion arrives. And, and that is talked about in verses 13 through 14. And I want to see if you see the similarity here of that champion, that one who will come and defeat those beasts that are persecuting God's people. Verses 13 and 14 of Daniel 7, it says this, I saw in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed." So without a question, Daniel is talking about Jesus Christ, the ultimate King of Kings and Lord of Lords, as he looks way forward to that, that final coming and return of the Ancient of Days, who is worthy to sit on the throne, who will vanquish all of his enemies. And, and, and notice what we saw. How's he coming? Behold, in the clouds. That's what Daniel said, right? So the very interesting thing is we see this connection is made with the saints suffering in the churches of Asia here in the book of Revelation. And, and the connection is made with them and the people God exiled in Babylon centuries before. We have similar language here. And, and, and the reason I'm pointing this out, folks, is that this is the theme of the church down through the centuries. This is the theme of the church, that we are in this world, and yet the beasts and the dragon and the temp tempters and the, the persecutors will rise against us. But there's always victory, right? And it's this cycle that happens, right? We, we suffer, but God delivers. He gives us grace. And there is this ultimate looking to the day when he finally vanquishes those enemies completely. But that's a theme throughout the Bible. I want to just talk about Psalm 2. David says the same thing, the same theme. Lord, we're your people, but we're suffering. And we're longing for your deliverance. And we know that one day it will come. So this is an age-old theme throughout all of Scripture and all the ages. Look at verses 1 through 12. It's a little lengthy. I want to read the whole psalm. But look what David says. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. That's what happened to David. That's what happened to the children of Israel in Babylon. That's what happened is happening to the church in Asia when John is writing. That's what's happened in the 12th century, the 15th century, 19th century, 20th century. Folks, that is the history of the church on earth right now. And David is going on here. He says, so the enemy, they take counsel against God. They hate him and therefore they hate his people. And they say this, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. I love that. So David is saying the enemies, they want to get rid of us. They want to bust those cords, the bonds. What is that talking about? I think it's the restraints that the gospel places on the soul. The preaching of God's word is a restraint to sin. Think about it. When the pulpits were alive in America, it was a different America. When people preached that there is a God with whom we will stand and give account, even pagans had some respect and were cautious a little bit more than they are today when it's not preached. And I think they're saying, let's burst these bonds. We don't want these restrictions. We don't want this constant morality preached. We want to burst the bonds, get rid of the Christians, and we can do what we want. That's always been the world's agenda. Those who don't know God want to get rid of him and his people. Let's burst them, burst their bonds, cast them away. He who sits in heaven laughs. This is, the, this is where we take our hope, folks. Even though people are 
scheming against us, even though the world is, is angry and hates the light and the truth of God's word, and, he, and many are persecuted, thousands upon thousands have been just butchered, murdered through the, through the ages for the name of Christ. And it looks like in many times, in many seasons of our history, Christianity would be wiped out. It looked hopeless. But God wasn't wringing his hands. David says, he who sits in the heavens laughs, not at the death of his saints, but at the attempts of the evil one to destroy his church, at the attempts of the wicked to snuff out his people. Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. So we may suffer, but we will never be vanquished. Now look what he goes on to say. The Lord, he, he laughs, but look what else. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with the rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. You see that, 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 that powerful gospel preaching there that David's doing. He's revealing to us that even though the, the enemy is raging, even though he sets his trap for us, God laughs because he knows the end. He says, my, my king is already established on Zion. He will inherit all the kingdoms. I will crush through him all of the enemies. So kings, instead of destroying me and fighting against me, you should kiss my son while there is hope. You should repent. You should fear me while there is hope. Kiss the son, it says, lest he be angry. But it also says, blessed are all those who take refuge in him. The attributes of Christ are all aligned here. He is God, who is a coming judge. David is seeing it all here. He's the coming judge one day, but he's also the only savior. So your choice is you can either deride him, hate him, mock him, run from him, or you can run to him, cast yourself on his mercy, and take refuge in him. Now look at this. We've got to continue. So, Just like the Christians of the past, we too live in a beastly world, right? Filled with ungodly opponents of God's truth. As John said in in his book in the New Testament, there are many antichrists that will arise, and they have, and they continue to do so. And what are we called to do? We're called to live our lives as Christians fixed with our eyes on heaven, right? Awaiting our blessed Savior. So this is really what Revelation is about. So let's notice what verse 7 is saying to us now, okay? So now we understand the theme of, of the ages for Christians, right? The dragon, the enemy, he wants to destroy God's people. He wants to destroy the woman's seed. And yet God is faithful to give his people perseverance. Even though they suffer now in this time, victory is coming. And so we live with one eye toward that. Verse 7, this is what he tells, by the way, this is the letter going to the Asian church that we're going to meet next week or maybe two weeks, but in a few weeks, (laughs) they're suffering, they're hurting, there are martyrs, and this is what Jesus says, behold, is what God says, behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Now let's stop a minute. What does this mean? He's coming with the clouds. So he's coming. What does the cloud represent? What is that talking about? The clouds, it doesn't mean he's coming on a cloudy day, a rainy day, right? It doesn't mean it's going to be a cloudy, overcast day. Clouds represent the glory and authority of Yahweh. That's what it's, he's coming in all glory 
and authority is what that is saying. Remember in Israel's history when they were freed and they were, they were freed from Egypt and God led them through the wilderness. How did he lead them by day? He led them with a pillar of cloud, a, cloud, a, a, a pillar of a cloud, right? And in the nighttime with a pillar of fire. But that pillar of cloud by day, it wasn't an ordinary cloud. It wasn't even a cloud. It was the glory of God in their presence leading them. It was the authority and glory of God. In Exodus chapter 19, what happens when the children of Israel arrive at Mount Sinai and Moses is going to go up and receive the Ten Commandments, he's going to meet with God. What happens? A cloud envelops the mountain because God has arrived in all of his glory. What about 1 Kings 8, 10 through 11? This is one of the most prolific verses that explained this to us. Look what it says. And when the priests came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. So without a question, without a question, the Bible just interprets itself for us if we read enough of it. The cloud represents the glory, the Shekinah glory of God himself. That's what Christ is coming back in. He's coming back in all glory and all authority. But not just is he coming back, and not just is he, is he coming back with all glory. Every eye will see him. Mm, look at this. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. And we have to stop and talk about this. This is This is huge. Especially in the camps of millennialism. What does this mean? Premillennial uh, uh, rapture, um, secret rapture. Uh, this rules out, I believe. And we're going to show why. I think the whole Bible also goes this direction. Um, but this verse seems to rule out any idea of a secret return where believers are snatched away, seemingly you know, disappearing without a trace. Even Charles Spurgeon said this. The Lord Jesus Christ will not come spiritually invisibly is what he means there for in that sense he is already here so christ is already among us and in, 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 in with his spirit and in his spirit but he will come really and substantially for every eye shall see him even those unspiritual eyes which gazed on him with hate so this again is all-encompassing who will see him all every eye will see him look at this even those who pierced him it says there in verse 7 Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Now, some would go back to Zechariah there, and Zechariah says the same thing about the coming king, and they will, they will look on him whom they have pierced, and they will mourn and weep. Some dispensationalists, some dispensationalists would say that this is only the, the nation of Israel, the literal nation of Israel that we're talking about here. They will weep because they pierced him. Uh, and rejected him. However, I believe that the Bible throughout its writings and, and throughout the, the, the pages is talking about everybody who rejected him. Everyone who ever rejected him will mourn. Even in Revelation in chapter 7, what does it say? It says, every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. All tribes will weep because of their unbelief in him. Not just the, the proper nation of Israel, but all tribes, meaning all people of the earth because of their unbelief, will weep when they see him. Now, I just want to say again, I think this makes a point that we really have to see throughout Scripture. So I'm going to read a few Scriptures now just so we have some more um, ammunition for this idea that, wow, the Bible does not talk about a secret snatching away coming of Jesus. If you look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18, this is one of the main verses that talk about this, this kind of a rapture, this sneak, this catching away. It says this, verse 16 through 18. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, there's a lot there, but one of the things that stands out the most is it's a noisy spectacle. It's a, it's a lot of stuff going on noise-wise. Shouts, 
trumpets, right? Voice of command. But we also see in this account the same consistency with the other accounts. Jesus is coming in his glory. Those who are caught up to his presence or caught up to his glory, it said caught up in the clouds. That's what that means, caught up in the glory with Christ. Let me continue, though. Matthew 20, uh, this should say 24, not 34. So that's Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Look what it says. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven a sign of the Son of Man. And then all tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, coming in his glory with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So once again, we see this, this is very hard to keep secret, I think, when the heavens are shaking, when the moon will not give its light, the stars fall from heaven. And again, we see this trumpet. There's a lot happening. Every eye sees him in this verse, Jesus says. Every tribe, again, mourns. The tribes of the earth will mourn as they see him. So there's two things happening in this verse, just like in Thessalonians. We see the wicked, when they see Christ return, they are taken off guard. They are, they are weeping. They are afraid. And the righteous are gathered into his glory. Right here at the same time in, 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 this, in Matthew 24 account. So he will both rescue his saints and punish the wicked at his return based on the verses that we see in, in the scriptures. Let's continue. Look at Second Thessalonians Chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, which makes this point. It says, this is evidence of the righteous judgment of God. Now, what he's talking about here to the, to the, to the believers there in Thessalonica is that they're suffering, right? He's talking about their suffering. And he says, your suffering is evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. Now, look what he says. Since indeed God considers it just, re, just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. So what do we see happening here in this verse, well known to describe the return of Christ? We see the wicked are going to be repaid. That's Paul's whole point to write this. He's saying, Christians, you're suffering now. But when Christ returns, he will repay. He will take vengeance on those who have afflicted you. And you will be rescued. So this is happening very publicly, all at once. I like what Richard Phillips says. He says, when John writes that Christ is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, this agrees with the picture throughout scripture of a cataclysmic glorious event that decisively ends history as we have known it. Now, did you hear that? I, I agree with it. This is, this is cataclysmic. I mean, every writer that we're reading from the prophets of the Old Testament all the way to Revelation, it's a cataclysmic event that the whole world sees at once. And everything is happening right there. The righteous are gathered into the glory of their Savior and the wicked are pronounced guilty by the judge of the universe. It's huge. I just want to say, I'm noticing in my notes a discrepancy. So I'm going to have my son put the next verse up that's on the slide. Or my son, well, Michael's my son now. Two, I have two sons up there. 
And I don't even have this in my notes here for some reason. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn, because I have bad eyes, and let's read this together. All right? This continues to build on this idea of, of what we're talking about here. Look at Revelation 6, 12 through 17. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide from us the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? That's, that's powerful stuff. And the reason I bring that up is we're saying, how can every eye on earth see his return? Many people have tried to play, you know, technology games and say, well, the Lord's going to come back. And the way every eye will see him on earth is through Facebook, <laughs> you know, your, your device. He'll be on Instagram and Facebook and he'll be on every, every tablet. And so people are around because of the curvature of the earth, of course, uh, he couldn't come back in one location and the whole earth see him. So they're trying to use television and, and tabletry and blah, blah, blah. This takes care of all that. This, this takes care of that problem. Notice some of the wording here. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up. We're talking about stars falling out of their place like a palm tree or a fig tree that is shaken and all the fruit and leaves fall off. That's what's happening to the entire cosmos at this cataclysmic event. God is rolling up all matter, all creation, like a scroll. It is disappearing. And I think the way we look at this verse as far as chronology, is the moment it begins is when the kings try to hide in the caves because they start getting glimpses of this, this, this throne as the world is collapsing around them. They see the throne of God. They're trying their best to find a hiding place, but to no avail because ultimately everything is gone. Everything is gone. And all created beings, both dead and alive, for, dead for centuries and alive when he comes, will be standing in a dimension that we've never stood in before in the presence of God on his throne. And every eye will see him. No technology needed. He said, I don't believe that. Okay, next screen. Next slide, please. First Peter 3. I think Peter had the same idea. Look what Peter, 1 Peter 3, 10, 13 says. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. That doesn't mean sneakily and quietly. It means you don't know when. You don't know when he's coming. He'll come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar. And the heavenly bodies, that's the planets, the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. And the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in, in, in lives of holiness and godliness? That's what I asked us at the beginning. If we believe this, how should we be living now? Do I believe this? waiting for and hastening the coming day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Again, what, what an amazing statement that is consistent with every other prophetic word in scripture about the coming of the Lord. It's cataclysmic. And for those who have rejected him, it is horrific. Everything is dissolved. There's no hiding places anymore. You're standing before the God you rejected. I don't care what atheist you are, how prominent you were, how haughty and arrogant you were. At this moment, every human being will stand before the God of the universe. 
and the wicked will be judged and punished and the righteous will enter into the joy of their salvation. And how do I see that in this? Because we see the wicked in fear, trembling until the very last. And it says this, the righteous are waiting for the new heaven and the new earth. We believe the promise. A believer, a Christian, what is a Christian? One who believes the promises of God. We believe his promise when he said that we're sinners. That's a promise that he's right. (laughs) We're sinners. We're unholy. He also promises that all sinners must face his wrath. We believe that. A believer in Christ is a believer who believes in the wrath of God. But we also believe his promise when he says, but when you were yet still a sinner, Christ died for you. And we also believe when we rest in that, that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. See, a believer believes in the promises of God, not our profession, not our great statements of faith or anything that we do, our good works. No, it's all in the promises and work of God. We trust that. And we believe in this promise that one day the whole universe will melt with fervent heat and there will be a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Now I have no idea where I'm at in my notes. <laughs> Put that next screen up. All right, perfect. We're, we're going to keep going here. So look at this. We've got this glorious thing, this glorious thing we've just seen. I know it's a lot to swallow up maybe, possibly, right? It's huge. I know we've got some very... Thank you, Mike. You're a good man. I think I am right back on schedule, though, even on here. But I, I should have done that first. I don't know why we did that. Because this is right, what I gave you guys. I just didn't update it on my technology. See, there it is. That, that's the problem. That's why it's going to melt with everything else. Amen. All right. But look at this. Verse 8. Because we have this wonderful kind of an interruption here, really, out of the, out of the eight verses that we've read so far. It's almost like you're, you're watching this, this Terence Pyre and a, a little spokesperson comes out and says, and now a word from God, because that's what's happening here. God, the Father, speaks. This is the, the, the first time he speaks, and we're not going to hear him speak again until the last of the book. But he says this, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, there's a couple things that happen, I think, with this. Number one, it's a period to what he just revealed. (laughs) It's like the big period, right? Christ is coming, everybody's going to see him. They're going to wail, they're going to mourn. So be it. And then God says, yeah, I am God. I'm God. I'm the Almighty one, period. But it's also as though he now is punctuating what is to come, validating, hey, everything that's to come in this book, everything revealed, I just want you to understand, again, it's from me, the the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. So let's look at what we see in this beautiful verse. We see, obviously, the sovereignty of God, the sovereignty of God. There was an unknown poet who wrote a little thing that many people kind of adapt is their theology, I think, sometimes, in, or philosophy, if you will, of life and how things are going, right, in the world with God and the devil, good and evil, so to speak. It goes like this. God's plan made a hopeful beginning, but man spoiled his chances by sinning. We trust that the story will end in God's glory, but at present, the other side's winning. Hmm. You know, so it's like, what are we going to do? Well, here's the point. And it does look like that. And I, I even told you that, right? That that's kind of the history of, of the Bible. It looks like the other side's winning. But don't forget, sovereignty means 
total control of the good and the bad. Sovereignty doesn't mean that only the good things that we see in the world, that means God's winning. Oh, God's in control of those things. And then when bad things happen, we, oh, the devil's in control of that. God's not winning. God's out of control. No, no, no. God being sovereign means that he is in control of everything in the cosmos. And this is something that puzzles us many times, but there is really no other explanation unless you want to be a dualist who believes that there's equal powers, Satan and God, they're equal, and we don't know who's going to win at the end. They're just battling it out. One wins a victory, the other one wins a victory today, one wins a victory tomorrow. We don't know what's going to happen. That's one way of looking at it, but the Bible doesn't, doesn't do that whatsoever. The Bible assumes without question God is sovereign, meaning that he even uses evil for his glory and purposes. Now, I don't understand that, but that's sovereignty. Either he is all sovereign over all things or he's not. Think about that. If there's another power in this universe that came into being somehow that has some power over God, then God is not sovereign. But the truth is the evil power that we all understand and know revealed through scripture is Satan who created Satan God so there is no individual power that Satan has everything he's got he was given by God and God knows exactly what he's got because he gave it to him and he knows what he's got and he created him for his own purposes that's it otherwise we've got a God who did some things and now he's got a list of things I wish I never did making Satan wish I didn't do that man making Seattle no I'm kidding whatever you know um, there's nothing like that with God everything God made and this is going to wipe us out mentally, right? Everything God created, including Satan, he said it is good. It's good. Now, Satan may be evil, but ultimately in God's plan, everything is good because everything works out for his purposes. That's what sovereignty means. Now, again, folks, we're, we don't have, I'm glad nobody in here understands sovereignty because if, it, if we did, then God wouldn't be the God we think he is. We can't understand him. But look at this. The eternality of God we see in this verse. The internality of God. I am the Alpha and Omega. <laughs> it starts with the, what, what the Septuagint would have is the, uh, 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 the, the, the uh, ego emi, the, the I am statement, statement. I am. That is the te uh, te tetragrammaton in Hebrew. Now what that means is those four letters, there's four uh, Hebrew letters. And those letters basically are the word Yahweh. We put vowels in there. There's none there. So, so it, that's the name of God. And we don't even really know what that name is. The, the, the Hebrew people stopped saying the name of God. Nobody would mention it through the years. So even today, there is no real consensus on what is God's name. How is it pronounced? What does it sound like? Nobody knows. Now, Yahweh is what we pronounce and that's translated many ways. The, the idea is it can be translated he who will be and is and is to come. He's already said that. It could be he who brings into existence all that exists. That's the same idea for Yahweh. It can simply be translated as it has been many times in the Bible. I am. I am. Why is it so hard just to come up with one name? Because he's God. Alpha and Omega. What's that mean? Alpha and Omega. It's a merism. A merism. Uh, basically, a merism is a literary device where, where you state polar opposites in order to highlight everything between them. So really, the idea here is God is not so much saying, I'm the beginning and the end. I want you to focus on that, that I'm the beginning and what I did at the beginning, and then I'm the end, so focus on that. He's really not even saying that. What he's saying is, I'm everything in between. It's just like, Amirism is just like when I say, I searched high and low. 
Now, do we really care if you search, like, did you search way up there? And did you search way down there? That's not what you're saying. You're saying, I've looked everywhere. That's what you mean, right? And that's what this means, alpha and omega. The focus is not so much on beginning and ending. It's on everything in between is what he's saying. And I am that. <laughs> Woo. I am. He lives in the everlasting now. He has no past and no future. Those are words for us. Those are terms for humans, past, future, but God is the I am. A.W. <laughs> Tozer tries to explain it like this. Because God lives in an everlasting now, he has no past and no future. When time words occur in the scriptures, they refer to our time, not his. Since God is uncreated, he is not himself affected by that succession of consecutive changes we call time. God dwells in eternity, but time dwells in God. God made time. Therefore, time dwells in him, but he... <laughs> He just am. Bad language, but that's it. I am. That's what it is. That's what he is. He just is. At all times, best analogy, very quick, very quick. I know, trying to understand this. Time is like a river. I know it's, all analogies fail, right, at some point. They break down because we're using human things that we understand. Of course, they're going to break down at some point when the finite tries to represent the infinite. But one idea is like a river, right? And we're on the boat, and all we can see is a few feet in front of us and a few feet behind us. We can see kind of where we've been recently, and we can kind of see a little bit where we're going, but we don't have the whole picture. But God is like at 30,000 feet looking down. He sees everything at once. Knows exactly where we've been, where we're going, what we're doing now, what we're going to, you know, all that. He's, but, and he's, he's present in all of those moments. He just is. And we're not. <laughs> what about this? We also learn from those words in this, in this verse. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come. What, what is that? This is, this is important that we get this. We see the aseity of God. Aseity is a theological word that simply means God is self-existent. He is, period. He doesn't need anything to be. We need some stuff to, in order to be. We've got to have food and oxygen and water, right? We've got to have warmth and shelter and different things. We have to, li we have, to have things. We have to have food to fuel our bodies to exist. But aseity, that doctrine, the aseity of God means he is self-existent in himself, period. Needs nothing else to exist. This is a, an amazing word. It's an amazing doctrine. You maybe didn't know when he came in, but aseity, right? Aseity, A-S-E-I-T-Y. I'm going to say it again. Get pencils out. Write this down I mean, if you want to, but it's a good word. A S E I T Y. Why is that little word so important about God? A C T. Because this is what makes God different than us. This is what separates from the, from us from Greek mythology and Roman mythology and every other man-made god like Zeus or Hercules or anything else where they're all pretty much just glorified men and women. But this doctrine, a C T, separates God completely from us. All of those gods depended on things they, they needed people they needed something right they needed love or whatever the fights and jealousies in those greek gods got involved in god is outside of all of that he needs nothing he is contained totally within himself this is important you see this doctrine in a surprising place i want to look at exodus chapter 3 verse 2 this is where where god reveals himself to moses in the burning bush remember that Look at this verse, just consider this. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not 
consumed. Have you ever thought about that? Now, yes, it's freaky and got Moses' attention. That was, a, that was part of it. But the whole theological point here is this. That's God. And that flame, he, that flame is burning because it's self-existent. It did not need the bush as fuel for the fire. That's why, the, that's why the bush was not burned up. It had nothing to do with God didn't need to have a source for that flame. Self-existent. Self-existing. And then we finally see, and we're about done, the omnipotence of God in this verse. Because look at the last. You think, what else can we drag out of verse 8? Good night. But let's read it one more time. <laughs> it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. And then he says this, the Almighty. The Almighty. That's the word for omnipotence. Pontus means all. Creto means dominion, power. That's, that's who God is. I am all power, all dominion, omnipotent. <laughs> this is important for us because this is how we can end this by saying, wait a minute, th this, is, this is who I put my faith in as a feeble, broken human being with fears and anxieties and worries and I see things in this world and I, and I try things on my own and I fail all the time and I'm always going to do that. And left up to myself, I, I'm going to fail miserably at everything, including my faith, including my faithfulness to God. But God reminds us in this verse, I am the Almighty. The whole book of Revelation is that Almighty God stooping down to those whom he loves and giving them hope, giving them courage, encouragement in himself, saying that I am your success. I am your hope. I am your salvation. I am, <laughs> and I am almighty. So you can continue to push on, no matter how hard it gets, no matter how many friends you lose to, to death and pain and suffering, no matter how much they beat you and, and try to get you to deny me, just remember that I am the ultimate. I am almighty. And that everything I've promised you will come to pass. Why? Because of my almightiness, I'm able to save to the uttermost, Hebrews tells us. I, through Christ, am able to save you to the uttermost. You say, well, why are people dying and why are people suffering? And why do the uttermost exceeds this world? Remember what he's shown us already. This whole world is done. And like Paul said, man, these momentary afflictions, the beatings and the stonings that Paul endured and other arrests and false trials and all these things, he said, they, they are nothing compared to the glory that awaits. And that's what Revelation's about. We can trust this God because he's faithful and he's omnipotent and he's all-powerful and he can do what he says he'll do. Let's pray together. Our Father, God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth that transcends our worlds. Father, I pray that your word today has caused many of us to be shaken out of our complacency. We call this world home far too much. We are so comfortable. And our plans for the future are more about little kingdoms that we're building in this temporary world than it is about your eternal kingdom. And, in, and, and even storing up treasures that will be transferred to the new heavens and the new earth when all of this is gone. So Father, may your word tonight by your spirit cause us to be transformed as your people and truly live in light of Christ's return and our future with you. And we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's all stand together as we respond to God's word in song.